Welcome to our presentation, State Meet Federal, Prosecuting Law Enforcement Involved Sexual Violence. My name is Holly Furman, and I will be introducing today's webinar. This program is hosted by Equitas and was developed by our presenters, Farrah Gold and Mara White of the US Department of Justice. Next slide, please. If you have a question during the presentation, please enter it into the chat box to your right. We will answer questions at the end of the webinar. You are also welcome to contact us directly at any time following today's presentation, and we will send you contact information during our follow-up. Today's webinar is supported by the U.S. Department of Justice Office of Violence Against Women. The information presented in this webinar does not necessarily reflect the views of OVW. Next slide. Equitas's mission is to improve the quality of justice in sexual violence, intimate partner violence, stalking, and human trafficking cases by developing, evaluating, and refining prosecution practices that increase victim safety and offender accountability. As a national training and technical assistance provider, Equitas develops resources, conducts trainings, and offers 24-7 consultations for prosecutors and allied professionals. For more information on Equitas, please visit our website at equitasresource.org. You can also follow Equitas on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. The link to each is available on our website. And if you're interested in connecting with Equitas on a regular basis, we hold virtual office hours on the third Thursday of every month from 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern. Our next office hours will be on July 15th, and we will be focused on investigating and prosecuting alcohol facilitated sexual assault. I will now turn it over to Jennifer Long. Hi everyone, my name is Jennifer Long and I'm the CEO of Equitas. If you're interested in learning about my background, you can visit equitasresource.org at the About Us page for my bio. And we're so excited today for this presentation because we know that state and local and all prosecutors are invested in and appreciate the importance of a uh, coordinated response, particularly to sexual violence. But I think sometimes we forget the important role that our federal partners can play in this process, uh, particularly in cases involving law enforcement involved sexual violence because there are unique dynamics and challenges. And our federal partners are sometimes, we fail to appreciate the ability they have to overcome these. So in this presentation, we're really hoping to assist state prosecutors with developing a process to determine how they're gonna work with their federal partners and conduct case reviews so that they can determine too, if a case is better, um, should be better prosecuted at the state level or maybe should be taken um, by their federal partners. And we're so happy today to have Farrah Gold and Maura White who are with the US Department of Justice. They are going to guide participants today in learning how to evaluate the state and federal systems, the statutes and the policies in order to make informed decisions on the most effective route of going forward in these cases. And a little bit about them, their bios are much uh, longer than this, so I'm really going to have to uh, I'm going to have to summarize. I will start with Farah. Farah Gold has worked as a federal prosecutor for the United States Department of Justice for more than 11 years. She currently serves as Special Litigation Counsel and Senior Sex Crimes Counsel for the Criminal Section of the Civil Rights Division. Farah has developed national expertise in prosecuting sex crimes committed under color of law. She was awarded the Attorney General's Award for Exceptional Service. This is DOJ's highest honor in 2014, and the Attorney General's Award for Outstanding Contributions by a new employee in 2012. And prior to joining uh, the Department of Justice, Farah served as an Assistant State's Attorney for the Broward County State's Attorney's Office in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where she specialized in prosecuting sex crimes and child abuse cases. Uh, Maura White also has a really impressive bio and I'm gonna condense it. I always feel so bad leaving things out. She has worked at the United States Department of Justice for five years. Maura currently serves as a trial attorney in the criminal section of the Civil Rights Division where she focuses largely on prosecuting law enforcement sexual misconduct throughout the country. 
Prior to joining the Department of Justice, she served as an assistant state prosecutor in the Cook County State's Attorney's Office in Chicago for over eight years, where she worked in the appellate, domestic violence, and felony trial divisions. In 2020, Farah and Mora prosecuted United States v. Eric Kinley, the most far-reaching law enforcement sexual misconduct case that the Civil Rights Division has ever prosecuted. Recently, they were awarded the Assistant Attorney General Award for Distinguished Service for their work on that case. So as you can see, we are really lucky to be joined by these great federal partners, and now we have people to call. And with that, I will now turn it over to Farah and Mora. Thank you, Jennifer. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our presentation on federally prosecuting law enforcement involved sexual violence. I'm Farah, and Mora and I are going to switch off today um, throughout the presentation. As Jennifer just told you, we are both federal prosecutors in the criminal section of the Civil Rights Division at the Department of Justice. We function the same as AUSAs, but we specialize in prosecuting civil rights crimes, so mostly hate crimes and law enforcement misconduct, but we particularly focus on prosecuting law enforcement sexual misconduct. So we basically are like a specialized unit. We're just based in DC instead of within each U.S. Attorney's Office. Um, sometimes we partner with our AUSA partners, sometimes we prosecute in lieu of them, and we'll talk about some of the advantages of having DC-based prosecutors come in later on in the presentation. Um, but we are really delighted that Equitas asked us to do this presentation to bring more attention to the fact that there is federal jurisdiction over sex crimes committed by law enforcement, and to bring some attention to the tools we have in the federal system to more effectively prosecute these perpetrators. We all know that sex crimes in general are underreported and sex crimes committed by law enforcement are really no different. And not only because the victim may not want to report, but even if she did want to report, how does somebody report the police to the police? And so we know they weaponize their authority by telling their victims that they have friends in the department and by reminding them that no one is going to believe them. So that brings us to our next point. Even if we can decrease the barriers to reporting, how do you build a case when your victim necessarily has baked in credibility issues because she was in custody, because she was under arrest, because she was on probation when the sexual assault occurred? And what's the most effective way to build up her credibility? These two issues, decreasing the barriers to reporting by learning about federal jurisdiction and effectively building a case despite those credibility issues are basically what we're gonna talk about today. Our hope is that by raising awareness about federal jurisdiction and the tools available to us in our prosecutions, we can encourage state and federal partners to work together to provide the best outcomes to marginalized victims and to hold more perpetrators accountable. And so well, before we dive in and I turn it over to Mora, there are just kind of a few caveats and things I wanna mention. We're gonna use the pronouns he for perpetrator and she for victim. We all know that all genders can commit sexual violence and can be victims of sexual violence, but most perpetrators are men and most victims are women or trans women. Anecdotally, in the world of prosecuting law enforcement misconduct, men are actually more often the victim of physical violence and women are more often the victims of sexual violence. And we're gonna discuss sexual violence in a pretty clinical way. We want you to know that we are not trying to minimize the trauma or offend anyone or make light of anything. In fact, let us be really clear that we fully know the gravity and the impact of these cases. The perpetrators who commit these crimes, they shatter lives with lasting and devastating impact. And it leads to an inherent and pervasive distrust of law enforcement. We hope we can present this material in a way that not only gives you some more tools to effectively bring these cases, but gets you excited to work on them and form federal and state partnerships. And we hope to do that by showing you the true impact that these prosecutions have on people's lives. We want you to ask us questions. We want you to comment as we go. We encourage you to do that. By now, you probably all know about the chat box at the bottom of your screen. So please feel free to write in a comment or a question as you need it. Uh, Jennifer and Holly are going to keep an eye on that box in case there are any burning questions about the presentation. Otherwise, we're going to leave time at the end to answer your questions. If we don't get to your question for some reason, or if you want guidance or want to talk to us, our contact info was on the screen a few seconds ago, and we can put it in the chat box at the end. Please feel free to contact us anytime. We hear from people all over the country with all levels of experience all, all the time, and we really are happy to hear from you. And 
To those of you who are uh, federal prosecutors, our partners in all of this, work for the Justice Department, uh, Moore and I did an extended webinar series about our statute about law enforcement sexual misconduct back in November. And you can find that on our internal Le Learn DOJ or DOJ book. If, you're, um, if there are any FBI agents watching or you wanna share this with F the FBI, you can let them know that it's on their virtual academy. Um, and finally, today we're gonna refer to case examples um, because we think it makes more interesting and it aids in learning. And you're gonna hear us specifically to refer to our law enforcement serial rapist case um, that Jennifer mentioned a few seconds ago, where the jury actually returned guilty verdicts on Thursday, March 12th of 2020, um, which you may remember is just as the pandemic was descending upon us. Um, who doesn't love to talk about their convictions, especially one that was the result of an investigation that is going on four years and spanned the entire country. Um, but really it's a great case study in all the nuances of a, a federal statute that we're gonna talk about, as well as the investigative statute, excuse me, strategies. And it's a really great example of when federal prosecution is necessary and why it's good to be aware that there is federal jurisdiction. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Maura to get us started. So getting back to those two main issues that Farah mentioned, decreasing barriers to reporting by raising awareness about federal jurisdiction and overcoming those baked in credibility issues to get the best outcome for our victims form our the foundation of our learning objectives for today. The first learning objective is to understand federal jurisdiction to prosecute government actors who commit sexual violence. To do that, we are going to look at the elements of 18 USC section 242, which is the federal statute that governs that conduct. Being familiar with this federal statute will number one, provide an avenue for prosecution where victims don't have to report the perpetrator to the very department where he works. Number two, it will remove the investigation and prosecution from the perpetrator's usual stomping grounds, literally from the department he works in and even the courthouse where he is used to testifying. And finally, it will allow us to collectively make the best jurisdictional decision for the case. It doesn't mean that state investigators can't continue to investigate. It just means where is the best courtroom to bring the case? And the second learning objective is to understand the applicability of three federal rules of evidence, 413, 404B, and 801 D1B that federal prosecutors can use to corroborate a victim's account and build a strong case, even absent physical evidence and eyewitness testimony. Your individual jurisdictions may have similar rules, and if so, that's great. And we're gonna talk about best practices for implementing them. But for those of you who don't, these rules are another set of tools to keep in mind when considering whether federal jurisdiction may provide a better outcome. And finally, the third learning objective. Once we understand the federal tools, we will discuss how to strengthen state and federal partnerships so that we can work together to determine the most appropriate jurisdiction to bring charges. That is, what are the advantages and disadvantages to each jurisdiction and what do strong partnerships look like? Before we get into the substance, we wanna know a little bit about you. And this brings us to our first poll question. So here it goes. What is your experience investigating or prosecuting law enforcement involved sex crimes? Your options are A, I've investigated allegations but not yet gone to trial. B, I've gone to trial less than five times. C, I've investigated lots of allegations and have gone to trial five times or more. D, I'm a victim advocate and work with victims and survivors of sexual violence. Or E, I'm new to this and that's why I'm here. So we'll give you a second to make your selections and we'll take a look at the results. And we'll close the polling in a few seconds. Okay, so it looks like there are a variety of experience levels. Um, hopefully there will be something for everybody. So as I mentioned, 18 USC section 242 is the federal statute that criminalizes misconduct committed by members of law enforcement at all levels of government against those they are supposed to serve. That statute, which we shorthand by saying section 242 criminalizes government actors' willful deprivation of constitutional rights. 
It may be more common to think of violations of constitutional rights by law enforcement officers in the context of an arrest made without probable cause, an officer's unreasonable use of force, or a corrections officer deliberately ignoring the medical needs of a prisoner, the incidents that we unfortunately see on the news all the time. However, sexual misconduct by a government actor likewise implicates constitutional rights, specifically the right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures, and think about gratuitous pat-downs that are the pretext for searches, and the right to bodily integrity and the right to privacy. Farrell will describe those in a few minutes. But the basic elements of a misdemeanor violation of 18 USC section 242 are, first, that the defendant act under color of law, second, that the defendant deprived the victim of a constitutional right, and third, that the defendant acted willfully. So in addition, there are statutory enhancements that convert an act of sexual misconduct that would otherwise be a misdemeanor into a felony. Those include, if the conduct resulted in bodily injury, if the conduct included the use of a dangerous weapon, if the conduct included kidnapping or attempt, and if the conduct included aggravated sexual abuse or attempt. And you may have all, some, or none that apply for any given sexual assault. Because of these enhancements, there are a wide range of penalties available, from a misdemeanor, as I mentioned, all the way up to life imprisonment, if you have either the kidnapping or aggravated sexual abuse enhancements. And this is just one of the considerations as to why federal prosecution may be advantageous. Also something to consider, the wide range of penalties lends itself to many options for a global resolution to both state and federal charges. And we'll talk more about that in a little while. But first, let's start with the first element, color of law. This answers the question, who is subject to this federal statute? Acting under color of law involves those who act in their capacity as a government official. The jurisdiction covers federal, state, local and tribal officials. And officials can be on duty or off duty. And there's the obvious, like police officers, corrections officers, probation officers and public officials. But there's also the not so obvious. And those are prison personnel like medical staff, contracted workers like, like in private prisons or other government entities, employees for government facilities like DHS and HHS, and state school employees. Generally, the standard is whether the subject used his authority as a government official to facilitate his conduct. If you're in this not so obvious category, check out the law in your jurisdiction, stay in touch with the AUSA in your federal district, or please feel free to contact FAIR or me. And this is where we wanna to start to address the elephant in the virtual room, so to speak. FAIR and I were state prosecutors for years, and now we've been federal prosecutors for years. We know that sometimes local prosecutors get along great with local US attorney's offices and that they form true partnerships. But we also know that sometimes there are real territorial disputes between the two, depending upon who the elected official is and who the appointed leaders are. Sometimes that leads to state prosecutors feeling like the feds poach their good cases and leave them with the leftovers. And likewise, sometimes it leads to federal prosecutors thinking state prosecutors make rushed decisions without their own investigations. And the truth is that when that happens, it gets in the way of all of us doing the best job that we can. We're all career public servants, regardless of who's in office. And we know there's no glory in prosecuting cops who commit sexual violence. There's nothing easy about these cases, whether you're in state court or federal court, and none of us is gonna get famous or rich from doing this work. That's not why we do it. We do it to hold the bad guys accountable to seek justice for these victims who are often the most marginalized in society. And of course, we like to go to trial and get convictions when the evidence supports it. But at the end of the day, we wanna make sure that we get, make the best decision for each case and for each victim. And so to that end, we really encourage you to find your federal or state counterpart who will be there despite what elected or appointed officials at the helm and can work with you to find the best outcomes as you go. And with that, let's get back to the not so obvious people in our federal juris, uh, jurisdiction. And we're gonna do our second poll question. So a man contracts with a local jail to transport a female prisoner on an out-of-state warrant back to the county that issued the warrant. If he rapes her along the way, is there federal jurisdiction under 18 USC section 242 to prosecute him? Your options are A, yes, B, no, or C, it depends. We'll give you a few seconds to make your selection and we will close the polling shortly. 
Okay, I think we can. Okay, it looks like a lot of you got it right. The correct answer is yes. Uh, I know it looks like some people said it depends, but it doesn't. He is performing a federal state function by transporting individuals and doing so via a contract he has with a government agency, the jail. Here, he sexually assaulted the prisoner while serving in his capacity as a contracted law enforcement officer. He was acting under color of law. And that brings us to the serial, serial rape trial that Farah mentioned a few moments ago. In fact, our defendant was a private prisoner transport officer. Eric Kinley drove around the country in his white Dodge caravan, picking up women alone on out-of-state warrants and sexually assaulting them. He had the same MO for every single one. He told all the women that no one would believe them because they were just, quote, inmates in transport. And he had friends in high places all over the country. This is a common refrain that you've probably all heard from most of your defendants who rape women in their custody, wielding the weapon of their authority. And the significant part about this case from a teaching perspective is that it started with two women housed together in the same cell in a small jail in Arizona. The defendant transported each of them separately. Those two victims confided in a third inmate who reported it to a jail official. And as a preliminary matter, I don't think anyone would be surprised if this case was dead on arrival. Two accounts by two women housed together and not much else. Plus, we knew that the defense would instantly be that these two women conspired to fabricate their stories despite no apparent motive to do so. That was January of 2017. Fast forward to March 2020. By the time we went to trial, we knew of 18 victims throughout the country. All 18 didn't testify, but many did. And we are gonna talk about how we found them and why some testified a little later. But for now, we're going to talk about the defendant's sexual assaults of those victims to illustrate the constitutional deprivation and the statutory enhancements, basically how our statute applies. But we also want to mention that because all of these women were sexually assaulted during their transport, it was clear from the outset that that small county jail in Arizona where the initial reports were made, they wouldn't have jurisdiction to prosecute this. And it became a challenge to determine which jurisdiction we could prosecute in for all of the other sexual assaults we learned about. As I said, Eric Kinley drove these women around over miles and miles over the course of several days and often several states. Some women knew where they were when they were assaulted, but others didn't, and they only remembered highway exit signs. One advantage of federal jurisdiction is that federal districts are geographically larger, and they encompass many local jurisdictions. Federal jurisdiction is therefore easier to prove than state jurisdiction. And for our trial, we had to use credit card receipts and historical cell site data to show where our defendant was in order to establish jurisdiction. Based on the victim's account and forensic evidence, we couldn't pinpoint this particular assault to an area covered by a state prosecutor's office, but we were able to pinpoint it to the Eastern District of Arkansas. That plus the fact that he was under, acting under color of law gave us federal jurisdiction. And in fact, it gave us an avenue to prosecution where there might not have been one otherwise. So in addition to color of law, the second element of a section 242 violation is the deprivation of a constitutional right. That's the misconduct that forms the underlying basis of the crime. So as Maura said before, when someone is acting under color of law and they engage in sexual misconduct, they're violating that individual's constitutional rights. And as a general matter, there are usually three types of sexual misconduct that deprive victims of their constitutional rights. Before I get into those, I just want to clarify one thing. We've been using the term sexual misconduct a lot as opposed to sexual violence, but that's only because a crime of violence um, in federal law has a very specific meaning. So we don't want to give you the wrong impression that for conduct to be prosecutable federally, it has to be, meet that definition of crime of violence. So like I said, there are these general three categories of prosecutable miscon sexual misconduct by those acting under color of law. They are number one, a non-consensual sexual acts. And again, there's a very specific meaning for the term sexual act under the federal code. It basically means oral sex or any kind of penetration, no matter how slight. The second type is non-consensual sexual contact. That again, has a specific meaning in the federal code um, and it generally means groping. And the third conduct that might otherwise look like it has a law enforcement purpose, but is really just a pretext for misconduct. And that's where you'll see gratuitous searches and pat downs, 
photographs, ogling, unnecessary um, or pretextual medical procedures. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we did have a question in the Q&A that I think will be important. They, there was a question on what was the federal charge in this case. So could you just clarify? Yes, sure. So the federal charge, and this is what we're talking about, the statute 18 U.S.C. 242. Section 242 is the federal statute that criminalizes um, deprivation of constitutional rights by government actors. So as Maura said before, oftentimes it comes in the, for, in the form of police officers using unreasonable force. And that's the kind of stuff you see on the news all the time. But it can also be used to prosecute sexual misconduct by those acting under color of law. And the key, as, of, as we're just talking about, is the underlying constitutional deprivation. So when a, and we'll talk about this more in a second, but when a government actor commits sexual assault um, in, the, in the course of his authority, he is violating 18 U.S.C. 242. That's the federal statute. That's the federal statute that we charged our prison transport officer with. Thanks so much. So these are the kind of cases, or excuse me, allegations, like Fair just said, where the alarm bell should go off that there is potential federal jurisdiction because the constitutional right was violated. And as we keep saying, the fact that we have federal jurisdiction to prosecute these cases is a good option for state investigators and prosecutors to have. It means better outcomes for victims. It means holding more perpetrators accountable. And you're also going to hear us say a lot. The sooner you hear those alarm bells go off, the sooner we hope you loop us in. Not because we're going to come in and take your case and mess things up. The idea is that we want to work together cooperatively, but because the applicability of our statute depends largely on the specifics of the victim's account, the earlier that we know about this, the fact that there may be federal jurisdiction, it's going to be better for the victim. The idea is that we can coordinate the victim interview so as to not put her through multiple interviews and unnecessarily and inadvertently create unfair impeachment which we all know is the way defense attorneys create a mirage of reasonable doubt. So who are your potential victims? Who are you gonna see when these um, government actors, law enforcement officers commit sexual assault? Well, you're gonna see the obvious, right? The people in custody, people under arrest, pretrial detainees, like our victims in our transport case. They may be in, in jail, not, not, getting convict, not yet convicted, excuse me, or they may be being transported back on warrants for probation violations. Or you may see it in the form of convicted people, right? Like women in state or federal prison or county jail serving sentences, right? Those are the obvious. But the not so obvious, those are the people you wouldn't think of, people who aren't in custody the way we traditionally think of it or under arrest. So for example, domestic violence victims, right? An officer serves a TRO and goes back and checks on her and checks on her and escalates into sexual assault. Also people in government facilities, we hear about undocumented people in DHS facilities, um, the unaccompanied minors in HHS facilities, those also may be your victims where there is federal jurisdiction as well. Or for example, a case I prosecuted in um, Chattanooga, Tennessee, where a Chattanooga police officer was working secondary at the university and he assaulted a woman working at concessions. I mean, she was a 65 year old woman who grew up with great respect for law enforcement. Now she's afraid to go home, excuse me, go out alone. You can also see students at um, state schools who may be victimized by state school employees or students who go on ride-alongs with police departments as part of an intern program. I had a case several years ago where um, a teenager was sexually assaulted by a sex crimes detective during a ride-along. I mean, she wanted to be a police officer uh, when she was younger until this happened. So why does the victim status matters. Well, it matters because it provides the basis of federal jurisdiction. And this kind of goes back to that question we had in the chat box. When a government actor sexually assaults someone, the victim status helps us determine the constitutional right that the subject violated. So it's gonna be generally either the Eighth Amendment if your victim is convicted, because think about it, a sexual assault by a prison guard is a form of cruel and unusual punishment and that's prohibited by the constitution. It may be um, a violation of the Fourth Amendment if the police officer is engaging in a gratuitous search, because as we all know, the Fourth Amendment prohibits unreasonable searches and seizures. But um, it also may be the 14th Amendment, and that's for the most part covers every other circumstance, because the 14th Amendment's due process clause has been held to include the right to bodily integrity. That is the right to make a voluntary decision about one's own body. And so sexual assault, sexual violence, groping, and that whole continuum of sexual misconduct violates those rights. 
um, and violates the, the right to bodily integrity, basically the right to consent to sexual activity. Um, because a law enforcement officer, when they act, they need to have a legitimate purpose for what they're doing. Non-consensual sexual conduct of any kind has no legitimate purpose, and courts all over the country have held that. So let's talk about proving that constitutional deprivation, because that's the crux of the case. And that looks a lot like proving any kind of sexual assault in any jurisdiction. So before we get to that, um, yes. and I'm so sorry again, you have another question, and I I did want to hold some of them to the end, but some of these are about what we're talking about, and I think because this is so unfamiliar maybe to some state prosecutors, I'm just gonna read the question to you and hope that you can um, uh, take it. So the fact that the crime was perpetrated by a federal employee couldn't be taken into account to establish who has jurisdiction. If the person is employed by XXX, then use that person's agency employment location. Not sure if you need additional clarification, but I'm thinking that the, I, the idea here is it doesn't sound like it's the status of the individual as an agency employee. Right. So it's that's the general idea. Acting under color of law is acting under any government authority. So as Morris said earlier, it could be local police officers, local probation officers, local state school employees, that private prison transport officer that we talked about in the van. All he was was a guy who was, who was um, contracted by local jails to um, transport individuals. I mean, it's scary because he's not subject to oversight or anything and he had the ability to do that, but he was performing a traditional state function. So it's not the status of who the um, subject is, right? If the perpetrator is any law enforcement officer, any government actor, quite frankly, prosecutors fall under that, right? Any government actors, um, there's potential federal jurisdiction if they um, commit sexual assault. So when I talk about the status of the victim, the only reason, I, because that may be, may be conflated here. The status of the officer doesn't matter. The status of the victim just matters to determine which element they, which, excuse me, which constitutional amendment they violated. Um, and it's just, just to kind of give you a sense of why we have jurisdiction, because this all goes to, you know, it's not a, it's not a separate federal statute that criminalizes sexual assault. It's all within this statute that criminalizes the deprivation of constitutional rights. Um, and when, when someone acting under color of law sexually assaults someone, they deprive somebody of their constitutional rights. And that's kind of what we're getting into now. So with that in mind, it goes right into our next poll question. Um, and it says, a corrections officer has sex with a female inmate. Is the fact that the inmate incarcerated sufficient unto itself to establish lack of consent in a federal prosecution under this statute that we're talking about, 18 USC section 242? And your choices are A, yes, B, no, or C, excuse me, C, it depends on the law of the jurisdiction you're in. So we'll give you um, a few seconds and I'll ask Holly just to put up the results when you think there are enough answers in. Okay, so I know a lot of you said yes. So here's the thing. No, it's not, it's not automatic. It's not strict liability. So courts have held that people in custody, and we're talking about federal courts have held that people in custody can consent. And we can have a whole philosophical discussion about agency and whether someone can truly consent in custody, that's for some other time. Here, as a matter of federal law, if we're going to bring these, this federal charge, you know, a violation under this statute, 18 USC 242, we have to prove that the victim didn't want it. But we do want to flag for you that if this occurred in a federal facility or a federally contracted facility like the immigration facilities on the border, there are federal statutes that make it a strict liability offense for corrections officers to engage in sexual activity with federal inmates where consent is not a defense. Just like there are many state statutes that have laws to make it a strict liability crime for a guard to have sex with an inmate in a county jail. And more and more, states have been enacting statutes that make it per se a crime for an officer to have sex with someone in his custody. And those state statutes should certainly play a role in the calculus as to where you should bring charges and why federal and state prosecutors should work cooperatively to determine who has the best and most effective penalty structure, who has the most readily provable case, because that may be state jurisdiction where consent is not a defense. Because as Farah mentioned, for a section 242 federal prosecution, 
consent is a defense. So let's get into that. So we're proving the co constitutional deprivation, which is the, the under, that's the, the act, that's the conduct. So there must be proof of no consent and no legitimate purpose for the officer to be doing this. So for sure, like I said, there is no legitimate purpose for sexual assaults, right? There's no legitimate purpose for any subject officer to do anything with his mouth or his penis. The only time this ever becomes an issue is in the context of investigating some sort of uh, search or medical exam. So uh, uh, an inmate goes to a prison doctor for knee pain and he unnecessarily performs a testicular exam. Or in the example of our prison transport officer, one of the many things he did was watch our victims urinate on the side of the road. So in those cases, you investigate whether you can rebut the defense that they're, uh, they're, you know, they're gonna claim there's a legitimate purpose. And our job is to show that it was pretextual. But at the end of the day, lack of consent, that's the crux of what you have to prove. It's like, it's most, like most sex crimes. Because we know a voluntary agreement to do something with your own body is not lack of consent. So think of it in terms of this idea of this right to bodily integrity, this right to bodily privacy. The idea, is that the subject officer took away the victim's right to do what she wanted to do with her own body. So if she actively chose of her own free will to have sex with that officer, if it really was knowing and voluntary, it's not a violation of this federal statute, 18 U.S.C. 242. Again, prove lack of consent like you would in any other rape case. So are there times when individuals choose to perform a sex act on an officer rather than get legitimately arrested? Sure. Um, but consensual sex is really not the type of conduct that's going to get reported to you. So let me give you an example of what I mean. Very early on when I came to DOJ, I was investigating an officer for sexual misconduct, and we were um, looking for all of the sex workers, people that were, you know, prostitutes and arrested for prostitution that he made the arrest of. And we found this woman, and we approached her, and we asked her about her interaction with this officer who had arrested her. And she said to us I, that she didn't recognize him at first. So had she recognized him when he arrested her? She knew that if she would have just given a moral sex, she would have been out of jail by Christmas. I give you this example because it was a clear cut time when like if she had if she had done that, it wouldn't have been a federal crime because she really did want to do it. I mean, that was what she was conveying to us. It may be illegal in your state for a police officer to have voluntary sex with a sex worker to pay for sex to do any of that. It's just not a federal crime. I mean, here's something that's telling. That woman that I just talked about, she didn't feel like a victim. She felt like she had agency that she was making her own choice. But I wanna be really clear. Consent that is the product of official intimidation or harassment is not consent at all. Um, I'm so sorry to interrupt you again. We really, we are getting a lot of questions. And again, I, I think this is a new, you know, yeah, it's sort of new. And I think it might be important to, uh, at the risk of interrupting your flow, just ask some of these. Yes. Um, so one of the questions, um, is about detention and what if the detention and the arrest was unlawful and there was not probable cause I'm not a hundred percent sure actually in terms of, in terms of that. So let me go, I'm going to hold that one for a second. Cause it was sort of truncated. Okay. Let me go, let me go come back to that. I'm going to ask whoever asked that question. Can you please repost it with a little bit more context because of when it's come up, but here's a question I want you to ask. What's it, what if you have a local law enforcement officer who is the local school resource officer rapes that person's wife? Is it not federal jurisdiction since he wasn't acting under color of law? And I know at one point you said, you know, off duty. So if you could clarify, or because with his role in the public school and the fact that he has power and control over minors, does it enhance the crime or does it allow for federal jurisdiction? That's the first one. So let me, let me ask, answer that. That's a really good question. So it, so it can be someone certainly off duty, right? They could be acting in their authority as a police officer. Like, for example, the example I gave, um, with the officer serving the TRO, if he comes back and checks on someone over and over again and he's off duty, but he has, you know, he's, he's there in that capacity as a police officer. Um, but an example of an officer who rapes his wife, um, this is where I would say you have to look at the law um, in your circuit. Um, as a general matter, if, he, if he's a person who happens to be a police officer who rapes his wife, then there's no federal jurisdiction because he's not acting under color of law. However, if he somehow is using his authority to do so, that's different. So you again, you have to look at the specifics in your circuit, but let's say he says to her, don't bother reporting me, I'm a cop. I'm gonna, I know everyone, you know, they're not gonna listen to you. No one's gonna take your report. 
um, if he uses his service weapon to threaten her, um, if he um, comes home, you know, when he, uh, during the day when he's on duty to do it. So you, those are really, really detailed questions you're going to hear as we go on more. And I keep talking about the importance of the victim interview and how the devil's in the details. And I think that's one of those. So I usually generally say, like, if you have a cop who's, you know, goes out on a date with someone and he just happens to be a cop, but he rapes her, that unto itself is like he's, you know, at a bar on a date and he rapes her. That's not under color of law. But again, it's fact specific. Does he use a service weapon? Does he use the fact that he's that he's a cop to get her to stop reporting and things of that nature? So it's a good question, a common um, scenario that comes up and a common question we get. And I have another question in there. And I also have some context for the other question about just what if an arrest is not based on probable cause? I think this is going back to the, co basically, I think the issue that was being asked is about coercive um, just the inherent coercion in an arrest situation. And I would just say for the purpose of this, um, I, I would say to the person who posted that question, we actually, Equitas has some other materials that look at um, sexually exploited women and girls and uh, coercion and duress in many circumstances, including arrest. And we can definitely talk to you offline about that. And we have some other resources about that. Um, I think that was that might answer that question. Then we have one other about agency policy that I'd like to pose to you, all prohibiting sexual misconduct. When a policy says consent cannot be affirmative defense for a policy violation, do you have any sort of insight on that? And again, I'm sorry to be asking you all these questions, but people are really engaged and they have some specific questions about what you're saying. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And I think some of these questions may actually get answered as we go on. So just let me touch on the first thing you mentioned, Jennifer, about, um, about the coercive nature. We're going to talk about that. I'm about to get to that. So maybe that'll be helpful. Re with regard to policies, right, that has to do with whether somebody gets into trouble at work. So Moore is going to talk about that third element of willfulness. That is the person knew it was wrong and they did it anyway, um, and that we have to establish. And so typically speaking, people know they're not supposed to rape. But certainly if their department has a policy that says you can't even have sex with that someone, that goes to proving that element. Does it in and of itself make it a federal crime? No, but it certainly, it makes it a fireable offense within that department. So let's just continue to talk about, um, I just had said consent that is the product of official in intimidation or harassment is not consent at all. Um, and, and I know you're, lo you're looking at the next slide, but that, okay, we're going back a little. Um, but the next thing is an individual does not consent if she is coerced into complying with a request that she would prefer to refuse. So we put those two quotes up on the screen because it's not, you know, Farah and Moore's way of interpreting the law. That's actually what the Supreme Court held in Florida v. Bostic. And that's really the way to look at, you know, whether someone is consenting because it is not submitting, giving in, acquiescing, acceding to getting coerced or getting cajoled. The vast majority of the time, victims are going to report what happened with their probation officer, corrections officer, arresting officer, because they did something they didn't want to do. So how do you prove lack of consent? And that goes to this question, right? How do you show that there is coercion? Well, we all know that screaming no is the obvious sign that a victim didn't want it and that the bad guy knew it. But we also know that there are a thousand reasons why a victim may never say no, let alone scream it. Um, and this is especially true in the law enforcement context. So look at those non-obvious factors that cut against consent. The ones that we're glad you're asking about because we urge our investigative partners and colleagues to keep this in mind throughout our investigation, right? So being under arrest or confined or on probation. I mean, custody is certainly a factor that cuts against consent because of the inherent coercive nature, right? And that's typically what you're gonna hear as opposed to someone saying to you, oh yeah, I wanted it, right? So that's certainly something to consider. The size differential, right? How big was the officer compared to the victim? The authority over the subject, uh, the subject has over the victim is huge. And especially, you know, probation officers and corrections officers, access to weapons, you know, they, a lot of, of these individuals carry service firearms, um, mental coercion, which is very prominent when there's grooming, especially think about probation officers who have access to someone's entire history and case file. And finally, how did the subject act? What did he say? Did he give the victim anything? So getting a benefit at the end doesn't mean the victim consented, right? Sometimes they get hush money or payments on their commissary or a victim is let out of an arrest 
because the, the defendant, the subject wants to keep her quiet and he doesn't want to get caught. It's not necessarily like, oh, she agreed to do it and she's happy to do it. Um, and Moore is going to talk a little bit more about this now because the subject's behavior can illustrate consciousness of guilt and establish that third element of willfulness that I just mentioned. So willfulness is when someone acts intentionally and voluntarily with the specific intent to do something that the law forbids. Acting willfully means the subject knew what he was doing was wrong and against the law, but he did so anyways. If we can prove non-consensual sexual conduct, a defendant will be hard pressed to argue that he did not know such conduct was wrong or against the law. Getting back to that question that was asked a few minutes ago, if it's against your policy, that's one way that you know something's wrong and you did it anyways, and it's a factor to consider. So let's talk about evidence that demonstrates the victim didn't consent and that the defendant knew it. And sometimes it's really obvious. She's crying, she's shaking, she's saying no, she's pushing him away. Sometimes it's because he threatened her in some manner. Maybe he told you, her, I'm gonna falsify these charges if you don't submit. I'm gonna say you violated your probation if you don't submit. Do you wanna spend the next month in the shoe? You want me to call DCFS and get your kids taken away? Think about that for a second. If you have to threaten someone to get them to have sex with you, they aren't consenting. Sometimes the best way to find out that the defendant knew she didn't want it is just to ask the victim in a non-accusatory, non-judgmental way. How could he tell you didn't want it? If someone walked into the room and saw what was happening, could they tell? We all know the victim didn't want it because she told us, but those questions show a jury beyond a reasonable doubt. That the defendant knew she didn't want it and there's no getting around that. Those details are going to get you to a violation of 18 USC section 242. Evidence of consciousness of guilt will also be consciousness of evidence, excuse me, of willfulness. Again, and defendants don't want to get caught and all the typical evidence that you usually use to show your defendant's guilty conscience also shows that he acted willfully. Many of those things are federal crimes unto themselves even if your subject is a local law enforcement officer. There may be false reports, destruction of evidence. Officers often make material omissions or falsify their reports to cover up their actions. They destroy evidence. Maybe they throw away the conduct. They delete incriminating photographs that they took of the victim or themselves. They make false statements. They lie to the FBI or local law enforcement. All of this is just another factor to consider whether deter when you're determining the most suitable jurisdiction for prosecution. The federal code has a whole host of obstruction of justice statutes that criminalize these precise behaviors that I just mentioned, that law enforcement officers engage in to get away with their crimes. But in addition to that, you're going to also see the following. A subject repeatedly reminding a victim that she's not going to be believed because of her history as a felon, uh, her status in custody. He may warn her to keep the misconduct a secret under threat of facing repercussions. He may commit this misconduct in a secluded location, maybe outside of the surveillance camera view. And he knows that because he wants to avoid detection. And we saw this repeatedly with our prisoner transport officer. And this is what he said to his victims over and over again. It's your word against mine. I know important people. You're just an inmate. You're just a woman. You're a felon. What happens in the van stays in the van. And finally, he dressed up the passenger seat of his minivan to make it look like another officer is present for those who may be suspicious that he was transporting these women alone. And you can see the hat on top of the headrest and the scarf right under the headrest, making it look like a person was there. And we showed this to the jury during our trial. So those are the three elements, the willful constitutional deprivation under a color of law. And as Morris said earlier, when we started, that establishes a misdemeanor violation. So just to be clear without more, coerced sexual intercourse, oral sex without consent, groping, those are all misdemeanors unless you can establish the felony enhancements. So obviously this is really important and it's one of those moments when you wanna consider the strength and weaknesses of your available state statutes and the facts you have and whether you have the evidence to make that federal misdemeanor into a felony. So let's talk about how do you do that? So earlier, Maura said there are four felony enhancements that you're mostly gonna see in sexual assault in investigations. We wanna encourage you to conduct the victim interview with these in mind, because that's how you make these. So they are that the conduct resulted in bodily injury, that the conduct included the use of a dangerous weapon, 
that the conduct included kidnapping or attempt, that the conduct included aggravated sexual abuse or attempt. So let's start with bodily injury. The maximum penalty is 10 years in prison. It can be mere pain, no matter how temporary. But it's important to note that it is not psychological pain. And the conduct needs to result in bodily injury, the officer need not intend to cause bodily injury. So we all know that many sexual assaults do not result in pain or injury, be it oral sex or groping or even vaginal penetration. But there may be information you already have in your investigative file or additional information you can get from your victim that will ultimately expose the perpetrator to a higher federal penalty. So for example, the injuries that are documented in the SANE report, the victims may disclose descriptions of fingerprint bruises on her breasts or on her thighs. She might say that the perpetrator hurt her while he was holding her head during oral sex or the belly chain digging into her back during the rape, her head banging into the wall or on a hood of a car. Those are the details that you wouldn't necessarily need to or even think to get during a state investigation, but are really essential to what federal charges are applicable. So again, that's why we say if you think federal charges may apply, Loop us in early. And again, it doesn't mean we're going to come in and take over, but we can remind you of these enhancements and spare the victim from additional interviews while keeping the federal options open. The next enhancement is the dangerous weapon. And like bodily injury, it also carries a maximum penalty of 10 years in prison. It's great evidence of willfulness. You know you're doing something wrong if you need a dangerous weapon to carry it out. So there's the obvious when we're talking about the dangerous weapon, such as holding a gun to someone's head. But there's also the not so obvious. And that might mean the, for example, the mere presence of a gun is not enough. Just the fact that the officer is wearing a gun on his duty belt, again, is not enough. That's why the victim interview is going to be important. And so for examples of some of the not so obvious, for our transport officer, those victims, he told one of them that it only took a bullet to the head, and he kept referencing the gun on his holster with his hand on it before and after the sexual assault. And he did that to keep her quiet. Another example might be putting the gun on a hood of a squad car as he's raping the victim and making a show of doing so, or threatening to shoot and kill a victim. And she hears the gun clanging on his duty belt during the assault. And this is where we wanna also know that there might be a separate federal firearms violation that would be applicable. And that means using, discharging, or brandishing a firearm in furtherance of a crime of violence, all of which carry mandatory minimum penalties. The last two enhancements we want to touch on are the aggravated sexual abuse enhancement and the kidnapping enhancement. And just anecdotally, it's probably more likely your crime is going to have one of these than bodily injury or even dangerous weapon, because like we keep saying, law enforcement officers don't really need to use their gun if they can wield their authority as a weapon to get to gain submission. But these two enhancements, aggravated sexual abuse and kidnapping, when they're applicable and your facts bear them out, first of all, there's no statute of limitations, which is huge. But secondly, the maximum penalty is life in prison. So I'm gonna to touch on what they are on each one of them. And I know that there, there's, we're giving you a lot of information all at once. And we just want this kind of like to kind of tuck in the back of your mind. So for aggravated sexual abuse, the way we like to explain it is to look at your underlying sexual assault that forms the basis of your constitutional deprivation. And then you want to determine if it amounts to what sex aggravated sexual abuse requires. It has a very specific definition. Again, we just kind of want to flag it for you to tuck it away in the back of your mind. As a preliminary matter, it requires a sexual act. So I said before that sexual act has a specific meaning in the federal code, basically penetration or oral sex. So you need that first. But then you also need either physical force or threat or fear of death, serious bodily injury, or kidnapping. So a note on that second point of threat or fear of death, serious bodily injury, or kidnapping, generalized fear of harm, I thought he was going to hurt me, it's not enough. It has to be this kind of extreme fear. I thought he was going to kill me, would be sufficient. Um, and by the same token, for force, it's not but like, you know, brute force. It's just the exertion of physical uh, power over the victim enough to overcome her will to resist. So again, not brute violence, not this like gory attack. How do you prove force? Well, at the risk of, of sounding like a broken record, the devil's in the details of the victim's account. 
So again, there's the obvious way to prove force if in fact it was a violent attack. Um, but then there's this not so obvious way to prove force that you get through that detailed narrative from your victim. He hauled her down with his body. He shoved her against the wall or on the hood of a patrol vehicle. One of our transport victims described that he physically held the victim against the van with his forearm and um, used his other hand to shove his fingers into her underwear. And in fact, he did so forcefully enough that our underwear tore. We could also could have an example of a, of a subject pushing the head, victim's head down. It doesn't have to be violently, just enough to, to overcome her will to resist. And this was a common MO of our prison transport officer. I mean, he would force the victims to perform oral sex and if they didn't comply easily, you know, out of fear, let's say, um, he angrily shoved his penis in their mouths, enough for this aggravated sexual abuse enhancement. And lastly, uh, in this regard, I wanna mention the kidnapping enhancements. You know, we, we know that we generally think of federal kidnapping and we think about crossing state lines, but that's not required for this because this is just the enhancement. We already have federal jurisdiction um, by the nature of the person acting under color of law. So for the purpose of developing the kidnapping enhancement, don't actually think about it as kidnapping. It's more of the way you would think of um, false imprisonment. So the victim is confined, restrained, unaware, unable to move about freely. It doesn't matter if the victim was lawfully in custody or if the defendant um, of the defendant or if she was in prison or jail. It doesn't matter if the victim was lawfully being transported by the defendant. So let's consider our private prisoner transport officer. There, among the other enhancements, we also charge the kidnapping enhancement. So Kinley drove alone with these women, as you heard, for days over hundreds of miles. He was permitted to do that part, but he wasn't permitted to do was to drive off his route to remote secluded locations with no one else around. And all of the women felt completely trapped and they really were. And so I'm gonna say something what we can't say to a jury. Imagine if it was you handcuffed in the back of that white minivan, driven to a place that looks something like that picture on the screen and feeling like you're trapped with no place to run. That's in essence, the kidnapping enhancement in a picture. Now that's not actually the picture of where he took them but it's pretty close. So hopefully you, this is just giving you the idea of what it looks like. What are some other examples of when the kidnapping enhancement might apply? A corrections officer takes an inmate to a storage closet or a locked room out of surveillance camera view, which is pretty common in prison cases where corrections officers rape inmates. An arresting officer takes an arrestee to abandoned dark parking lot instead of transporting her directly to jail. Like I said, the kidnapping enhancement, the maximum penalty is life, just like with aggravated sexual abuse, the maximum penalty is life. And for both, the sentencing guideline range is a really, really high. Some of you may be familiar with the federal sentencing guidelines. They're advisory in nature, um, so they're not mandatory, but they actually do advise the court. And because of that, um, when they're, especially when the kidnapping enhancement and the aggravated sexual abuse enhancement apply, federal prosecution gives you a really good option to hold the defendant accountable. So that's our summary of our jurisdiction and the federal statute that we have available. But next, we want to mention some of the practical aspects of investigating sex crimes and law enforcement sex crimes in particular, and some more advantages that a federal partnership may bring to the table. So we all know that most sex crimes don't occur in front of an audience. The victim is the only eyewitness. And you can see the quote on the screen uh, there from Farah's uh, case in state court from 2009, where she prosecuted a wrestling coach who molested his students. And that quote is as true then as it is now. This stuff is applicable to all sex crimes, but the focus is on, on the victim is especially challenging when you're prosecuting law enforcement sex crimes. If your experience is anything like ours, regardless of what kind of sex crime it is, you are victim focused and you're trauma informed and you work hard to protect your victim from unfair impeachment and unnecessarily giving multiple statements. But regardless, here, there are baked in credibility issues just by virtue of the fact that these victims are in custody. Earlier, I mentioned that the things that Kinley told his victims, he reminded them of why no one would believe them because they were in custody, because they had a criminal history. Sometimes it was crimes of dishonesty. They had a, a history of drug abuse, mental health issues. Therefore, it's our job to build the victim's account up because the defense will do everything it can to tear it down. So how do we do that? We do that by corroborating the victim's account and foreclosing what Fair and I refer to as the lying defense. And we're gonna focus on three federal rules of evidence to allow you to corroborate your victim's account and build your case. 
even where there are no independent eyewitnesses and there was no apparent physical evidence. Rules 413, 404B, and 801 D1B. You may have similar state rules that allow you to corroborate your victim's account in just the same way, but the federal statutes are particularly strong. And again, they are something to consider when determining the most appropriate jurisdiction for prosecution. And we're happy to talk to you about this individually and whether you have comparable state rules that it can achieve the same thing. Of course, you may have times where there is physical evidence and we already mentioned the stain report, but that like DNA or the subject statement is a topic for another webinar. Likewise, Farah and I have presented a webinar that addressed three other federal rules of evidence that you can use to protect your victim's account. But for today, we're gonna to focus on the rules I just mentioned. And let's start with rule 413 and then rule 404B. So here's what we knew about our prison transport officer when we started. These two women housed together in that jail in Arizona, both alleged pretty brutal assaults. He vaginally raped one of them at gunpoint and he forcefully digitally penetrated the other while threatening to shoot her, telling her all it takes is a bullet to the head. It's the rare sex offender that gets caught the first time. And it's the rare sex offender that starts out with such anger and such force. Usually he's victimized someone else to a lesser degree, maybe groping them or fondling them or just demonstrating creepy behavior, testing the water to see how far he could go without getting caught. We figured that if these women in the same cell were telling the truth, then there were probably other victims out there who just needed to find them. And the same goes for your subjects. And we knew that we had two rules, Federal Rule of Evidence 413 and 404B that would make those accounts of those yet to be located women relevant and potentially admissible. 413 in particular is one of the strongest tools that the federal system gives us. And it's a rule of inclusion and allows in other acts of sexual assault for any matter which is relevant to corroborate the victim and to establish propensity to commit sexual assault. In fact, Congress enacted Federal Rule 413 because it recognized that there isn't often independent corroborative evidence of sexual assaults separate from the victim's account. So basically it codifies this idea that there's strength in numbers and literally it lets you stand in front of the jury and argue if he did it before, then he must have done it this time, which is pretty unheard of in the federal rules. And think about how powerful that evidence is and how it eases the burden of that one initial victim's account. So rule 413 is subject to a 403 analysis, but generally speaking, when you're in federal court, the sexual assault doesn't have to be the same pattern as the one charge. It doesn't have to be within the same time frame because there's a recognition that sex abuse crosses generations. Though the similarities and the pattern certainly helps in that 403 relevance and prejudice analysis. And most significantly, that there doesn't have to be the same relationship between the offender and the victim. So why is this a big deal? Well, it means that if your defendant is accused of raping an arrestee, you can also look for those he victimized when he wasn't acting under color of law. So look for ex-wives, girlfriends, and colleagues. And this is where that question comes in about, well, what if someone, a cop raped his wife? You may not be acting under color of law for that purpose, but if you find that he did in another instance and you prosecute that, the rape of the wife can come in um, as, as 413 evidence. And so it's a good opportunity for those victims to be heard, to be vindicated, especially if those rapes occur a long time ago and are outside of statute limitations. So for our transport officer, to date, we found 10 women that he sexually assaulted. So including those two initial victims in that jail in Arizona, for the purposes of 413, we had those 10. And we'll go into how we found them in a few minutes and you'll hear how finding them really did make all the difference. Next is rule 404B. This is the one we most commonly know and the one <clears throat> which most often has a similar state rule. And it permits us to enter similar fact evidence in our case, including crimes, wrongs, and other acts. We can't use it to establish propensity to commit the crime, but the rule permits it for another purpose, such as proving motive, opportunity, intent, preparation, plan, knowledge, identity, absence of mistake, or lack of consent. And as a general matter, rule 404B evidence has to be of a type that is similar to the charged conduct and not too remote in time. It's especially useful to show a pattern of conduct where it didn't culminate in a sexual assault. It's not uncommon to see grooming and testing the waters. This comes up a lot when the subjects are probation officers or corrections officers. There, they have long-term relationships with the victims. They know how to gain their trust and they prey on their vulnerabilities. 
And we saw this in our transport case. In fact, for all of the transport victims we found, Eric Kinley's MO was the same one as the two women who first reported. He picked them up alone in a white unmarked Dodge Caravan and almost instantly, he began making sexually inappropriate comments, bragging about the size of his penis, falsely claiming he was a federal marshal, then ultimately veering off into a dark secluded area under the guise of getting lost or allowing the victims to urinate. And for the 4013 victims, he sexually assaulted them. For the 404B victims, he made them think they were going to be sexually assaulted or killed. And either because they didn't present as an easy mark or by the grace of God, somehow they were spared. But either way, this was textbook rule 404B evidence because we heard it over and over and over again from ultimately 16 women he transported and two of his former partners. In addition to the two women we charged in the indictment, during our trial, we were permitted three more sexual assault victims pursuant to rule 413 and two more pursuant to rule 404B. And just as a point of practice, our victim that we listed in count one of our indictment, we found years into the investigation. So basically, our efforts to find Rule 413 victims yielded another victim whose assault we could charge in the indictment. So you know the rule that allows you to admit other acts of sexual assault, 413, and you know the rule that allows you to establish a pattern of behavior, 404B, but now what? How do you begin finding these victims? And it might seem daunting, but the difference between two victims instead of one is exponential. It could very well be the difference between indictment over declination, guilty plea over trial, and frankly, conviction over acquittal. And it takes work, and we know that, but nothing worth doing is ever easy. And this really is worth it. So the first thing to do is start looking to your pool of victims. It's easier when there's a finite pool. So a for a probation officer, get his current caseload and his old ones. If it's a corrections officer, find the names of the inmates in the pod. It's going to be more difficult for a road patrol officer, but it's not impossible. This is all doable. It just takes time. You can get the personnel file, take a look at the grievances. You can cast a wider net, including probation arrests, domestic violence calls, DUI arrests. Predators prey on vulnerabilities, and that's where your victims will be. You can look at their social media accounts. You can find out who blocked them. For example, Farah and I handled a case involving a road patrol officer who sexually assaulted a woman during her transport to jail. During the course of the investigation, we got his Facebook records and I noticed that a woman blocked him. So I asked the FBI agent to talk to her and find out why she blocked him. As it turned out, he engaged in the same sexual misconduct with her as they did with the arrestee. And she was admitted at trial as a rule 413 victim. For our transport officer, we got his records, but even that wasn't easy. Kinley was a one-man show, so it wasn't like we could just subpoena his company records that he kept in his house in paper form. So the FBI executed a search warrant on his house once he was arrested, and we seized eight banker's boxes of disorganized documents. All told, including the two original victims, as I said earlier, we located 18 victims who experienced some form of creepy behavior all the way up to rape at gunpoint. And just as we suspected, he didn't get caught the first time and he escalated in severity and depravity as time went on. And one of the biggest advantages to federal jurisdiction is this, we have the luxury of time. No doubt we're all busy, but unlike in state court with a fast paced docket and a hundred sex crimes to handle at any given moment, the advantage of a long-term investigation is just that, it took time. And because of that time, we were able to find so many of his prior victims. And when we did that, we were really cognizant of the potential defense argument that these women would just tell the FBI what they wanted to hear. And that of course was the argument that the defense tried to make at trial, but it went over at like a lead balloon because we planned for it. And this is what our agent did and what we recommend those of you who are local detectives, you might wanna try doing. When our agent located each potential victim, he simply told them he was calling about their transport officer. He didn't leave them or suggest anything. He didn't tell them the specifics of, of what he was investigating because he wanted to lessen the likelihood that the defense could argue that these women were lying and telling our agent what he wanted to hear. And that's because even for rule 413 or 404 B victims, a victim is a victim. And therefore we know that per defense counsel and per societal myths, the defense and the argument is gonna be, she's a liar no matter what. So here's what we kept in mind throughout all investigations and we try to do all the time. 
People don't lie for no reason. They don't lie just because they wanted to say different words. But we know that they have to have a motive to lie. I mean, if someone lies, there is a reason. Think about it. When it's a child who wants to go outside and play, he lies and, and says that he did all of his homework. Whether it's you telling your best friend that you like a partner, even if you don't, because you don't want to hurt her feelings. Whether it's a subject lying to the FBI about paying his taxes because he doesn't want to go to prison and everything in between, there's a motive if they're lying. And so think about that when you're going through your investigation, why would this victim make up this rape? And if you can't come up with a legitimate motive or reason, the answer is that she isn't. And so as I often tell the jury, she's telling you what happened. And so the defense is going to make, come up with a list of made up motives. They just will. And we see this time after time. Our job is to debunk them. It might be that she had a consensual sex with the subject but she doesn't want her boyfriend to know. So she told them it was rape. She jumped on the investigation bandwagon, either because she heard it in the rumor mill or because the investigator suggested it. Or she jumped on the civil suit bandwagon or filed her own civil lawsuit because she wants money. Or maybe she had nothing better to do that day than to report a false rape allegation to investigators. The way to rebut these defenses or show these motives are made up other than establishing the pattern of behavior that he did it before using those other two rules brings us to our third rule of evidence that we wanna talk about 801 D1B. And to the extent it's appropriate to have a favorite rule of evidence, this would be mine. And so we saved the best one for last. And the reason I like it so much is because it says, prior consistent statements are admissible as substantive evidence to rebut the defense of recent fabrication or improper influence or motive. So what does all of that mean? Well, contrary to the general pro prohibition against hearsay, this rule allows the jury to hear about a victim's prior consistent statements made before the investigation began, before the civil suit was ever filed, before the investigation made it to the news, especially before you, you or your investigators contacted any of those victims. And this is because those statements show that the victim disclosed her assault well before any of those so-called motives even appeared. So she couldn't have made it up, for example, just to tell an investigator what he wanted to hear because she long ago disclosed it to someone else. So how do we prove that? We find that someone else or what we know to be outcry witnesses or early disclosure witnesses. And we ask our victims, whether they're it's the original victims who reported it or those 413 or 404 B victims that we find later, we ask them, who is the very first person you told about any of this before you contacted the civil attorney, before you officially reported it, before we ever showed up in your lives, before all of those would-be motives to lie surfaced. And then we go and we interview those outcry witnesses. And again, it's one of the advantages of a long-term investigation. Usually victims confide in someone, counselors, parents, friends, religious leaders, or they confide in, in some other matter. Journals, emails, texts. Those texts, those statements come in substantively to show that she was consistent well before any of those so-called motives arose, pursuant to Rule 801 D1B. So let's look at that transport officer or any sexual assault allegation for that matter. Look at what we have developed so far without even looking at physical, scientific, or digital evidence or any statements made by the subject to authorities. You have a thorough, detailed victim's account you have witnesses who can testify to prior consistent statements that corroborate her account and undercut her motive to lie. And you have other victims who experience sexual assault or similar behavior and witnesses who can likewise testify to those victims prior consistent statements and early disclosures to rebut the bandwagon defense. And so you built your case without any physical evidence and without any, any eyewitnesses, thanks to those three rules, 404B, 413, and 801 D1B. Um, but consider it this way. So think about all those famous people who've been accused of sexual assault in the last several years. So think about an initial victim who came forward and the argument that was all over the news that she made it up because now this person is famous. But now think about the evidence that actually it turns out that victim, she disclosed the assault years before, well before the subject was ever famous. In a courtroom, those prior consistent statements would come in to corroborate her account. Now think about all of the other victims who came forward after that initial victim did. Sure, there was that argument that we all heard that they jumped on the bandwagon because the subjects in the news are famous. But as it turned out, all of those other victims, 
they each disclosed their assaults to somebody years before. That would come in to undercut the bandwagon defense. In a courtroom, all of that evidence comes in to prove what the initial victim alleged, that the subject, the famous person, did in fact sexually assault her, as she alleged. It doesn't matter that there was no physical evidence. It doesn't matter that there were no eyewitnesses. And really, it's a pretty strong case. And that's all without even getting into the traditional investigative steps you should take, whether it's a delayed report of you know, 10 years or five minutes, the strategy of subject interviews, effectively using digital forensic and physical evidence, witness testimony to corroborate other aspects of the victim's account. But of course, that's all for another day and for another webinar. We hope our overall message is a positive one, that determining the best place for jurisdiction really is the most effective way to get the best outcome for your victim and for your community. And that's accomplished through fe strong federal and local partnerships. As a preliminary matter, if the location of the offense is known, we recognize that if we have federal jurisdiction under Section 242, then you usually have state jurisdiction for some type of state sex crime. But there are circumstances when federal jurisdiction is more advantageous than state jurisdiction and vice versa. And that doesn't mean that state investigators and federal investigators can't work jointly. It's just a matter of which courtroom the case should be brought in. And here are some things to consider. And there's disadvantages and advantages to each. As we mentioned already, the advantages of state strict liability statutes where consent is not a defense. That's a big deal because we all know getting a jury to understand lack of consent is not an easy thing. And likewise, we discussed when time and resources are a legitimate factor to consider as well as whether proving venue may present difficulties. But there are two other factors worthy of consideration and they may bend in favor of federal prosecution. The first is whether your victims are required to testify before a grand jury or during preliminary hearings. And this is really important. And we've done a prior entire webinars on you know, victim interviews, neurobiology of trauma, protecting victims from unfair impeachment through filing appropriate motions in limine and avoiding multiple statements that cover the same substance. Because all it takes we know is going to trial one time to know that the more statements a victim gives, the harder your case is. And um, as mentioned earlier, I was a state prosecutor in Florida. Depositions are a normal part of criminal discovery. Those tra transcripts from those depositions, they made trial that much harder for victims and they were not a vehicle for truth seeking when it came to sex crimes. So along the same lines, if you can avoid those depositions, if you can avoid putting the victim in the grand jury and creating those transcripts, avoid it. The federal system affords that advantage. It was one of the biggest changes I had when I came to the department from being a state prosecutor in Florida, because the federal system doesn't require victims to testify before the grand jury or in a deposition in order to secure an indictment. And this has to be one of the biggest advantages to federal jurisdiction. There's really just no good reason to make a victim testify in the grand jury if it's not required. I've heard a lot of attempted justifications as to why it's a good idea um, to either in a pretrial hearing or a grand jury to, to elicit that testimony. It's just not. I've heard, get, let's get a one good detailed account, let's lock in the victim's testimony. But given everything we know about trauma, there's no guarantee that pretrial testimony is going to be the vehicle by which to memorialize every detail of the assault in one transcript in a, in a chronological way. Writing report is gonna accomplish the same thing, getting down what she said, and she can't be substantively impeached with someone else's report. Unlike cooperating or reluctant witnesses, if a victim refuses to testify, if she disappears, you don't have a case. That transcript isn't gonna help you. I've also heard that it's good practice for the victim or we wanna test, uh, test our credibility. But we know there's no practice to be had by re reliving trauma. She's not gonna get used to it. You don't want her to get used to it. There's no way to ever know how a victim is gonna do on the stand. I mean, you can get a sense when you meet with them, but the most important thing is to, for them to tell the truth. Her credibility is gonna be determined by how it measures up in light of all of the other evidence. And then finally, I've heard, you know, this is the way we've always done it. We've always put the victim in the grand jury. Um, that's never a good reason to do anything, let alone making a victim testify during a pretrial hearing. So we really recommend not doing it to avoid it if you can. And if you wonder, you know, you think you're doing it, think to yourself, like, what's the purpose of it? Because there really is no good purpose. The other factor that may favor federal prosecution is the victim's understandable distrust of law enforcement. And as we said at the beginning, victims are hesitant to report the police to the police, especially if that officer bragged about all of his friends in law enforcement and all of the authority that he has. 
So if the subject is a local officer, the victim might be more comfortable with federal agents and federal prosecutors, especially if the federal prosecutors aren't even from there. And we can literally say that to the victim. We don't live here. We're not friends with any of the officers, but we're aware of the negative connotations of coming from DC, but we can actually be pretty helpful because we have no skin in the game and less of an appearance to the victim that we do. And it usually is just an appearance because in practice, we're all objective and we wouldn't want to give a second thought to prosecuting a cop in our jurisdiction if the evidence warranted it. But sometimes the extremes happen where our colleagues forget about their constitutional obligations and let their biases get in the way. For example, years ago, we learned of a state prosecutor who instructed the grand jury to consider the allegations that a local police officer raped someone in his custody. But instead of instructing them on probable cause and sticking to the evidence, this prosecutor inserted their own opinion. They told the grand jury that the career of a captain of a police department is on the line. They told the grand jury that this captain was engaged in an error of judgment, was stupid, was morally wrong, but they should apply the reasonable doubt standard, not the probable cause standard as they do with other crimes. They told the jury that in this case, where a police officer has to face charges of rape, the standard for the indictment should not be probable cause, especially when you're not dealing with the career, a career criminal, like a drug dealer. Not surprisingly, that case was no build. And there are a whole host of issues with what that prosecutor said, but for our purposes today is that they tried to raise the standard of proof because the subject was an officer and the crime alleged was rape. Obviously that prosecutor is an extreme example of what not to do. We all not only wanna be objective, but we want to appear objective. And sometimes to do that, federal jurisdiction may be the way to go. And the goal should be to all work cooperatively to reach the right outcome. That said, though, we, really, we know we can't be proceeding on parallel tracks. We can't have state prosecutors and federal prosecutors charging and proceeding to trial separately. It's not good practice. And I don't think any effective prosecutor in the right mind wants another prosecutor interviewing their victims and witnesses and creating additional statements as the case is progressing to trial. It's also really just not fair to the victim, right? This is among the worst, um, if not the worst, experience of her life. Trial's brutal. You don't want two sets of prosecutors prepping a victim uh, to testify. It seems like it's a recipe for disaster. So we want federal prosecutors to be on the same page. And the best result is to work together before we even think about those parallel tracks by working toward pre-indictment global resolutions. A guilty plea can hold the perpetrator accountable and can spare the victim the indignity of testifying and being cross-examined. Defendants may even be willing to plead guilty if they know that both the states and feds have an interest. And this can be especially effective where there are multiple victims, because as we discussed, and we all know these perpetrators get uh, rarely get caught the first time, chances are there are other victims. And sometimes there are victims, as we were talking about, who assaulted while not acting under color of law. A global resolution could account for all of his crimes and all of his victims. So going forward, before we wrap up and address some of your comments, more comments and questions, we hope that we've motivated you to develop the state and federal partnerships and to think about the statute a little bit more. Um, the best way we can illustrate the significance of these cases, though, is really not with our own words, um, but through one of the words of our victims. So Moore is going to read an excerpt from a victim impact statement that we filed with the court. For context, in 2014, the defendant drove her from Texas to Oklahoma via Little Rock, Arkansas. Along the way, he drove her to a dark, isolated park and he physically forced her to perform oral sex on him while she was handcuffed and shackled in the back of that white unmarked minivan. And here is part of what she said. Coming to court to testify was one of the hardest things I have ever had to do. I didn't wanna do it. At first I was so nervous because Kinley told me he knew a lot of people in law enforcement and that no one would believe me. Even up until right before I got on the stand, I still felt like Kinley was in control and he was going to have a whole courtroom full of law enforcement and supporters there for him. It went through my mind that he was probably even friends with a judge because that's what he told me, that he had contacts in high places. I never thought that anyone would believe me because of what he said to me. I even thought at first that Mora and Farah might be there questioning me to help their friend out, not me. I know now that it was my mind playing tricks on me. He put a lot of fear in me. Now I'm able to see that people were trying to help me, that they were there protecting me and treating me with respect. 
I just want to thank the entire team who helped me from the bottom of my heart for believing in me and protecting me. And we want to thank all of you for joining us today. We want to thank Jennifer Long and Holly Furman and Cynthia Hatchell at Equitas for their time and patience with us and for giving this, us this opportunity to speak with you. We encourage you to contact us anytime. Our contact info is on the screen. We would love to hear your ideas about how to strengthen federal and state partnerships and increase awareness about our federal jurisdiction, because we know um, from your questions and just from our experience that it's just not that widely known that we have the ability to prosecute these cases. So we'd love to work with you more and um, we'd love to talk with you with any questions and we'll, we'll um, answer your comments and questions now. Thank you. So I have a couple and thank you. Um, thank you so much, Farron Moore. And for everyone else, um, obviously these are very complex sex crimes cases are complex and we you know, could do a week on how to prosecute the case and all the intricacies. And so I really appreciate that the two of you were here and you really pointed out some of the ways our federal partners can help us in ways we probably weren't really thinking of. At least I wasn't before we talked. So um, I do have some questions. One of them was about the um, requirement for um, pain. And the question was, can um, psychological pain that manifests in physical pain fall under the bodily injury for the purpose of the statutory enhancement? So that's a really interesting question. The st federal statute specifically says psychological pain doesn't count. So given that, you know, I get that you're saying the manifestation of physical pain, it's an interesting question. It's not one I've tested. My guess is that it would be no. I mean, it's got it. The, the statute specifically says resulting in bodily injury. I, I think you need something that's more direct and that might be too attenuated, um, but it's a good shot. And I like your thinking. <laughs> Here, okay, here's another general question. And in terms of spending time with us, very appreciative. Are you all or are people training local law enforcement or how do you get the word out to local law enforcement so that they also know this um, ability of their federal partners to help or to come to you? I mean, we're doing it by like doing things like this, right? I mean, we're doing the best we can to um, to get the word out there. But if you and you want to contact us and you want us to do trainings, we're more than happy to. You know, we are we're getting really good at this format of webinars, but we could also you know soon appear in person as well. I'm more, I don't know if you have any ide other ideas, but this is part of one of our goals is to increase awareness that we have this jurisdiction. Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that. Um, we think might work is being able to do things either, you know, sort of re regionally, if, if that makes sense, or the fact that we do these sorts of webinars um, makes it easy for a lot of people all over the country to participate. So if you guys have ideas or if you have particular things that you'd want to see trainings for, reach out to us and we can try to work something out so that we get the word out to the local law enforcement as well. And I have another follow-up and I think um, someone had asked about posting the case uh, case law. And I think as you were talking about Eric Kinley, I'm, I don't know that there was a published opinion in that. I know there was a conviction. I'm assuming that there's no um, appeal or anything where the facts are published or if there is there. There's no opinion. Um, he, sentencing was supposed to be next week, but he fired his lawyer yesterday. So that's getting postponed. Um, but there was a conviction. Um, there's lots of pleadings that are filed, right? So I mean, more and I are happy to send them to anyone who wants the pleadings. Um, I recently also wrote an article for the ABA Criminal Justice Section magazine. Um, and I don't know if if um, Jennifer, you guys have the ability to send it out to participants, I certainly can send it to anyone who's interested. It specifically addresses this federal jurisdiction and working with state and federal partners. A few years ago, I wrote an article um, for what was called then USA Bulletin, but it is um, now, it is available on Westlaw. It's called something else now, but it's specifically about 18 USC 242 and federal jurisdiction. So there is actually information out there, published stuff. I'm happy to share it. Um, and we and you know we used Eric Kinley as an example just because it covers so much, um, but we've prosecuted a lot of these cases all over the country. You know I know there's a movement to increase prosecutions of law enforcement and that, you know those who commit sex crimes should be prosecuted, but we've been doing it for and and have amped up our prosecutions in the last decade. So there are a lot of federal opinions out there. No, and I appreciate it. And we'll definitely, um, for people who attended the webinar, I think we at Equitas have the ability to send some things out because of our um, 
to wider range because of our um, status as a resource center that we share um, with National Sexual Violence Resource Center to the extent that we can, we will. Otherwise we'll put you, um, we can put you in touch with Farah and Mora. Um, and just also, you know, uh, to remind people of the other resources that are on the Equitas website to include um, webinars and some other articles about prosecuting um, sexual violence and intimate partner violence perpetrated by law enforcement. Um, at the state level. And it really does take, um, it takes everybody really uh, taking these cases seriously, understanding how to investigate them, working together to understand where uh, you may have advantages in bringing them forward. And just even thinking about your discussions on the rules of evidence. I mean, for 413, you're right. I mean, most states don't have 413 propensity, basically a lower burden for admitting other acts, but even 404B, because it is so, um, it's one, I think it is the most appealed rule of evidence. And so therefore, if you're in a state where you have some bad 404B law, this is another way. I mean, you obviously we're always telling people to make good records and to keep pushing things forward with the court, but this is also other areas where you might want to sit and, and talk to your federal partners, because if, um, if it's more advantageous and you're able to get in that evidence there, um, that's something to think about. And just another piece you had talked about, um, the motive and bias, and it was so excellent thinking about how we, you know, how we can demonstrate that people reported before they even had motive and bias. And obviously, you know, evidence of that has to come in, in terms of due process, if the, if the victim has a motive or bias, but you can have a bad motive and you can have bias and you can still be the victim of a rape. So we also know how to overcome that even when there is a true motive. And so it's something other to think about, you know, again, like I said, this is something we could have gone weeks in. And I do encourage people, if you have cases, you've got Farah's um, information, Mora's, and of course our Equitas attorney advisors are always available to uh, take your questions and to work through cases with you. And even to bring in Farron Moore, if it, if we need a whole you know multidisciplinary team to figure out where it goes. And I just really just quickly saw a question that came up just a second about Perfect. what about patients in state hospitals? Yeah, state hospitals are those are state employees, right? So one of our colleagues just prosecuted a case involving, and it was federal, but it was a VA doctor. So I guess state employees. There might be. Um, uh, district specific case law that we just have to check on, but as a general matter, I would say, yes, let's, let's at least look at that. Um, and, and just real quick, a comment that Jennifer, you said about the motives, not uncommon in most of your cases, I bet, but certainly in ours, for our victims to have companion civil suits. I mean, you may have heard, may have heard of 1983 actions, that's a civil counterpart for our statute. So we have to overcome the fact that these lawsuits are filed. And you know what, like, if you're raped in custody, you're also entitled to file a lawsuit, like, you know, and you just kind of own it. And that's, and that's um, one of the things you do. And one of the ways you also establish that it's truthful, uh, the allegations is by those prior and prior consistent statements, excuse me. Okay, well, at this point, I'm just checking. I know we've gone a little bit over, but I'm trying, we have some time. I'm just checking through to make sure we've hit on everything. And as I imagine, as people think about this, or maybe um, if you're watching this as a recording and you do have any questions, we do uh, tell, we do really encourage you to reach out to us and talk to us at any point, all three of us yes. <laughs> um, and others at Equitas. And with that, um, if there's something else, I'm just going to turn it back to Holly to just close us out. Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, just to follow up on what Jen said, um, on Monday, you should be receiving a follow up with the link to the webinar recording, as well as bios for uh, Farah and Mara, um, a PDF handout of the presentation and uh, a presentation evaluation. So uh, we thank you in advance for filling that out. Other than that, uh, have a great rest of your day and a great weekend. Thank you.